We're continuing our discussion on the seven goals that economies have. So what are the goals we've discussed so far? So the first one was standard of living. How do we measure standard of living? GNI per capita, poverty rate, education rate, human development index. What was the second one? The second one was economic growth. And how do we measure economic growth? Real GDP per capita. So the total value of all the final goods and services produced in a country in a year divided by uh, our population. All right, so the third one we're gonna look at is full employment. And for the most part, these first three goals go hand in hand. For the most part, when you achieve one, you get close to achieving the other. So let's look at full employment. So what do we mean by full employment? Full employment means that everybody who wants a job has a job. Now the challenge is, is that it's impossible to truly have full employment. That is, everyone who wants to work is working, it doesn't ever happen. We have to consider the fact that there's always gonna be some unemployment. And those types of unemployment are frictional and structural. So frictional unemployment is voluntary. So perhaps you've always wanted to live in British Columbia where um, it is lush and green and is not minus 40 in the winter. So you pack up, you leave your job here, you move to beautiful Victoria, British Columbia, and then you look for work. You chose to be unemployed, it is voluntary. This is frictional unemployment. So we're okay with some frictional unemployment because we identify with the fact that people will want to change jobs. The other type of unemployment we will have is structural unemployment. Structural unemployment is unemployment that happens because of changing demand patterns. So you're probably not buying the same products that your parents bought when they were your age. So if we think about um, a Betamax, a VCR, a record player, are you buying these goods? Well, probably not. You probably stream most of your music and your videos, in which case we don't need people to make record players and Betamax and VHS cassettes and VCRs. So those people get laid off as there is less demand for the goods and services they make and they have to go and find a job in a different industry. So as our society changes, we have structural unemployment and we're okay with it because we recognize that we're not going to want the same goods and services that our parents had. The challenge with structural unemployment is that it's not easy necessarily to go find a new job if you've been trained in those industries where there's no longer demand. So you may have to go back to school or we may have to wait until the next generation goes and gets education and training and enters other fields. But we recognize there's always going to be some frictional and structural unemployment. So when we actually define full employment, we are going to define full employment as having an unemployment rate between four and 6.4%. Okay, so why this range? Well, first, this definition comes from the OECD. This is the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. These are the countries that are competitive economies. So competition economies like Canada and the US, uh, we are members of the OECD. And so the OECD defines full employment as having an unemployment rate between four and 6.4%. That allows for some frictional and some structural. Now, because each country defines being unemployed differently, what does it mean to be looking for work? Um, what are some of the exceptions? You know, what if you're laid off because of um, a temporary, like if we're in the oil, if we're in the oil field, what if you are laid off for one month while they're um, 
doing uh, upkeep cleaning and then you get hired back? What if your union's on strike? Do those things count as being unemployed? Those definitions differ between countries. And so because of that, if we wanna actually compare unemployment rates between countries, we need to recognize those differences. We will look at that in more detail. But that means that the amount of unemployment that we're okay with is going to vary between four and 6.4%, depending on how your country calculates that unemployment rate. So we define full employment, everybody who wants to have a job has a job, as having an unemployment rate that's between four and 6.4%. So we're measuring full employment by looking at the percentage who are looking for work who can't find it, and that's the unemployment rate. So how do you get the unemployment rate to go down so that more people who want to have a job have a job? Well, you stimulate economic growth. So that first goal, uh, or sorry, the second goal of economic growth, they go hand in hand, okay? now. Some of the challenges with full employment is that we could make full employment our top priority for our economy, okay? Well, one way to do that is just to create jobs for everybody. Now, the challenge with that is that if that is the top priority, it can lead to inefficiencies because we're simply paying everybody for doing something and it doesn't actually matter to us what they're doing, how well they're doing, how productive they are at doing that. If our first priority is simply that everyone has a job and is getting paid, then it can lead to inefficiencies in the economy. And we talked about that in an earlier video. We looked at the example of the Indian Hindustan Fertilizer Corporation And what was their story, right? Everyone got paid, everyone worked, uh, but the challenge was is because the equipment was not installed correctly from the beginning, they didn't actually produce any usable bags of fertilizer. Now, if the priority for your economy is that everyone has a job, then that doesn't matter. But if you're trying to achieve multiple economic goals, uh, like economic growth, um, then you need to increase your productivity. We need to get more per out of each worker. And so uh, the challenge here is that inefficiency. The other challenge we have with full employment is as it relates to the next goal we're gonna talk about, which is stable prices. And so unemployment and inflation are inversely related. So what do we mean by that? Well, when inflation is low, unemployment tends to be high. When inflation is high, unemployment tends to be low. Now we need to be clear though about which one is driving which. And so we have here our graph. This is, I'm just gonna move my face if I can here. So this graph here is called the Phillips curve. The Phillips curve shows the relationship between unemployment and inflation. And when you draw graphs, it's important to know what is on the horizontal axes because that's the one that is the cause, the driver. So here, it's what is happening with unemployment causes a change in inflation, in prices. So let's think through this process here. All right. Unemployment is high. So when unemployment is high, let's see if we can write this out here. When unemployment is high, okay, or unemployment is going up, then there's lots of competition for workers. Oh, this pen is laggy. There's lots of competition for workers. So if you're a business and you have lots of choice on who you hire, who do you hire? You hire the best for the least, right? So when there's lots of competition for workers, wages are going to fall. This is going to reduce the cost to the business. 
And if the cost of the business is less, then the prices will fall as well. We can also look at it from the perspective of what is happening with demand for goods. When the unemployment rate is high, so unemployment is high, If unemployment is high, then we don't have a lot of income, right? A lot of us have been laid off. We're getting less hours, less shifts. So when the unemployment rate is high, then our income is going to be less. And if there is less income, then we're going to buy less. Ugh. And if we're buying less things, how do businesses get rid of their supply? Well, they put things on sale. Remember that buy less, that's a decrease in demand. And decreases in demand cause prices to fall. So when we have high unemployment, we're going to have low prices. We're going to have low inflation. When the unemployment rate is low, then lots of people are working. It's really hard to find workers. And if you can't find workers, how do you steal them away from the competition? Well, you pay them better. So wages go up, cost to the business goes up, prices go up. So low unemployment causes high inflation. We can also look at it from the consumer perspective. When the unemployment rate is low, we're all working, we're all making lots of income, we're flush with cash, demand goes up, and when demand goes up, we're all competing for the same goods, driving up the price. So the Phillips curve is that inverse relationship between unemployment and inflation, but it's important to understand the Phillips curve is about how unemployment causes inflation to go up or down. It doesn't say anything about the other way around, about the impact of inflation on the number of jobs. So where do we currently stand when it comes to the unemployment rate? Well, you can see here the unemployment rate over time. So here's a big spike in the unemployment rate. In Canada, the unemployment rate hit 20%. In the US, 25% in the late 20s, early 30s. So what was happening then? The Great Depression, okay? Uh, we can look at other spikes here. So this is that 2008, 2009 recession. Here is unemployment due to COVID and the closure of businesses, um, particularly in the summer and fall of 2020. And then you can see it starts to decline as businesses start to reopen in 2021. The other thing I want to point out to you is what is happening here in the 70s. The 70s was a unique period. Oh, I, let's go back a little bit here. So in the 70s, whoop, we're seeing unemployment go up. Now, what's different about the 70s is that, as we talked about with the Phillips curve, when the unemployment rate goes up, the inflation rate goes down, right? So increased demand when we all have jobs, when the unemployment rate is low, causes prices to go up. When the unemployment rate is high, we're all watching every penny, demand is less for goods and services, prices go down. In the 70s, we have a period called stagflation. Oh, stop moving. Stagflation. And what's unique about the 70s is that it's a period of high unemployment. and high inflation. And we hadn't really seen that 
at other points in history. We didn't quite know what to do with it. So let's talk about why stagflation occurred. So we talked previously about the Phillips curve and how when the unemployment rate is high, uh, we tend to have deflation or lower prices. But let's look at this period of stagflation. Let's see if I can find space to write here. Okay, so what happened in the 70s is that there was a supply shock. So what we saw is that there was a decrease in the supply of oil. So less oil available worldwide. And we can see here's demand, here's supply. When you have a decrease in supply, what does that do to price? Well, that decrease in supply of oil causes the price of oil to go up. Now, the challenge with oil is oil is in everything, okay? The tires on your car, uh, the gas in your tank, uh, the Tupperware, the, the plastic water bottle, it's all originating from oil. The other problem is, is that when the price of oil goes up, gas prices go up, and now it costs more to get the apples to the grocery store. So in other words, when the price of oil goes up, the price of everything. Ugh. Come on. Goes up. Okay, well, when everything gets more expensive, uh, what do you do? Well, you have to watch your pennies. You can't buy as much of the same things anymore. You're now having to pick and choose what to do. So the price of everything went up, which means that people bought less. And if people are using all of their money to buy the basic necessities, the essentials, then why do we need to make more televisions? Why do we need to make more cars? If people are all cutting back on the amount that they're buying, we don't need to produce as much. And if we're not going to make as much, then we're, people will get laid off. Well, the challenge is that if people are laid off, they have less income. What should happen when people get laid off is that it should be less spending and that decrease in demand should drop down prices. But that's not what we saw, right? It's not a change in demand that was causing the economy to contract. It was a change in supply. And so at the same time that you are seeing prices go up, we are seeing the unemployment rate go up. Now, with people being laid off, they should be buying less things. It should be pushing the price down, but it couldn't go down because the cost to make everything was going up. So businesses couldn't afford to put things on sale and lower those prices as you naturally would see like we were talking about with the Phillips curve. People get laid off, they have less money, prices should fall. This issue of high prices and high inflation was exacerbated by some of the policies we used to try to fix this. So because this is, was unusual, we weren't expecting to see high inflation and high, pre, high unemployment, the solutions we were using weren't necessarily the right ones. So one thing we did was we printed more money. If there's more cash in circulation, then people could afford to buy stuff. They could pay those higher prices, right? But the challenge is, is that when you increase the money supply, when there's more cash in circulation, it's the same goods and services, but now what you have is more people who are able to afford it. So that increase in demand just drives up the price even more. The other thing we did was we tried to regulate markets. So people couldn't afford goods and services. 
let's put in a minimum wage. Let's ensure everyone has more income. Well, we know when people have more income, they can afford to buy more goods and services. Again, driving up demand for those same goods and services, causing more inflation. So the solutions that we had put into practice, they were all driving up demand. And we know that when you increase demand, it also increases prices. So the challenge with the 70s is we had high prices, high unemployment, because it was a supply shock, because the costs were higher, that high unemployment couldn't drive the prices back down and the solutions that we kept implementing were causing more inflation rather than less. All right, so we've looked at some periods of uh, high unemployment here. We'll look more at inflation in the next goal. Uh, but let's look at some more what's currently happening with the unemployment rate. So we said here is the high unemployment from COVID and from previous recessions. So when the economy is growing, unemployment rate goes down. And when the economy is contracting, when we're in a recession, the unemployment rate goes up. Here you can see the unemployment rate July 2021 across the provinces. So we see Alberta right here uh, at 8.5%. So this is about where we were in uh, 2016. We were at about 9%. If we look at uh, some other periods of time, so if we go back a year, for example, to 2020, then Alberta's unemployment rate is 12.9%. So it was higher in 2020 um, when the peak of the impact of COVID and it's starting now to fall. Canada-wide, the unemployment rate uh, is 7.5% as of July 2021 compared to 10.9% in the previous year. Now, if we look here on the left, you can see the unemployment rates of youth. Uh, this is actually from 2015, but I did want to point out this comparison here um, in terms of how the unemployment rate of, of youth tend to compare across countries. So Canada in 2015, the unemployment rate of people between 15 and 24 was about 12.9%. The unemployment rate of youth is always higher than it is for the general population because businesses would rather hire people who have more expertise, years of experience, degrees. Of course, that's probably why you are here uh, getting your certificates, diplomas, degrees right now. Uh, you can see there are other countries that have even higher unemployment rates among the 15 to 24 population. The challenge, of course, is that as people retire later in life, there's less jobs available for those who are just coming of age. Uh, so the unemployment rate then is higher among the youth because of that. Um, this can create a lot of upheaval within the country. We've seen protests in places like Greece and Spain where the young population can't find work. And it's directly tied to the fact that the older populations are having to work longer uh, in order to fund um, because they don't have adequate retirement, they don't have adequate um, uh, pension or supports within their country, and then they're having to continue to work later in life. As we're looking at uh, what it looks like across the world in terms of unemployment, I just want to show you this real interesting um, infographic here. And it looks at who are the biggest employers in the world. So this is data from 2010, uh, but it looks at who the biggest companies are in terms of number of employees. At 3.2 million people, the Department of Defense, the U.S., uh, has the most employees. So the U.S. military essentially is the biggest employer in the world, followed by the Chinese army, uh, followed by Walmart and McDonald's. So we can look at the types of jobs that are available uh, as well as the number of jobs that are available.